it's still kind of sweet. So you just go down to this. You just go down to our super bad and she has still pretty extensive. Yeah, I didn't bother calculating. I just I put them in the column and I said, yeah, this is a girl. This is a girl. Yeah. 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 But I have to go all the way up to X to the 12. Okay. Um, I have some graded homework for you. Just to practice. I spent this weekend in the time on the ball. It doesn't seem like it's overly difficult. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have to look at that. You have to do it like a three. Yeah, we're going to talk about the exam. Okay. And two three. and start going through the key and discussing this set. And then we'll discuss the test. That doesn't show up too great. Could we, could Rodney, would you please hit that light for me? That's my job. I know, I'm sorry. I don't mind. Okay. All right, so uh, hopefully now it's visible. Again, scanner's not doing that great and making it look good, but because some pages look like that, and so I don't know. We're having... I don't know what that deal is with that, but that doesn't look very good. But anyway, so this is my key. Um, so the things in chapter or in problem seven that you could get. Um, let's go ahead and I guess talk about the things that we had to do here. First, we had to write out the statement of the question. Um, okay, fully. At least it has to contain the full question and all the information in a way that is understandable to a reader. Um, and that's worth at least two points. Um, I'm kind of going kind of by the way that I graded 240, 250 with, with that. A sufficient statement of question is a couple points. A figure as needed is worth a couple points. Starting with the equation with the name is worth a couple points. Getting the correct final thing is worth a couple points. And having your work done in symbols in between properly is worth a couple points. But can't exactly hold me to that. All right. So anyway, so what we did here was we... Imagined that I had a particle moving under the effect of a force that's a function of velocity, and I wrote Newton's second law. I noticed in this case my left hand side depends on velocity, so I choose to write my acceleration as the first um, derivative of velocity so that I have a variable for which I can solve uh, an ordinary differential equation. All right, um, and then I rearrange things so that I have my variables separated, meaning everything that depends on, in this case, V is on one side and everything that depends on T is on the other. I integrate from initial to final values, which in this case is from zero to T as a function of time and V naught to V as a function of time. And I get this expression, which was the expression that was desired. So I'm done with that part. And I go back to my statement question. I was also supposed to use that expression to solve the special case where the force is a function of velocity is a simple constant and comment on that result. And so I uh, did so and I got an expression. In fact, I, got, I went ahead and solved for location as a function of time and I recognize those two equations as kinematic equations. So just look at it. All right. Uh, things that could happen there. Um, Insufficient statement of the question or a lack of statement of the question would have been two points. Um, now, starting with next time, if you don't box, and this includes the test, if you don't box the thing that is the answer to the question, you can expect to lose a point. All right? And if it requires units, you should have units on it as well. That's, all, that's worth a point as well. Okay. But that'll start next time. Um, that's all I got on that. On, uh, let me see. Is there anything else for this particular one? Um, let's see. Now, some people actually made this problem harder for the second question, and they 
use the drag force instead of the a constant force, which wasn't what the question asked, so that was minus a couple points. Um, another thing that happened was some people solved this equation for F naught as the thing on the left hand side. And I know this is sticky tack, but we generally want the thing that is the function of our independent variable, which in this case is time, we want that on the left hand side in a final statement of the question. So we want the dependent variable as a function of the independent variable in the future. No points off for it this time though. Okay. That's how we figure it out. Um, and honestly, that's how I figure out what I care about because it's my first time teaching the course. So, right. um, so what else have we got here? Uh, statement of the question for or were there any questions about number seven? Any other questions regarding the rubric or anything like that? Okay. So number nine, uh, solve the differential equation two point two nine for v as a function of time. Oh, we we solved that should be in past tense. Sorry. By inspection, now we're going to rewrite the equation in a separated form and integrate from zero to t to find v as a function of time. And then we're going to compare that result with 2.30. So I went ahead and drew a figure of my situation. Uh, this is an object which is falling. That's the way that 2.29 was done, so that down was called the positive y direction for that particular problem. So if I want my solution to be the same as that solution, I have to choose the same coordinate system. So that's all labeled there, free by diagram. I wrote up my Newton's second law. I plugged in my y components of forces and set that equal to, in this case, those are functions of velocity. So I set that equal to m times dv dt. It's a one dimensional problem. So if you didn't do subscript y, that's OK. Um, all right. So then I sort of did what was asked, and I got everything that depends on v on one hand side by dividing by vy minus v term, the quantity, and multiplying both on both sides by dt, I get this expression, which I'm then going to integrate from initial to final, and I labeled that there. Um, so I get my expression on the left hand side, and on my right hand side is a natural log of vy, um, of v my, vy final minus v term, divided by vy initial minus v term. Okay. All right, so there's my expression, but I still need to solve it for vy as a function of time, which is just algebra, which I did. And then I looked at 231, and it wasn't the expression that was desired. So then I did a little bit more algebra and noticed that it was the same as 2.30, which is what I was asked to do. So here we go. All right. Um, so in terms of the rubric here, um, again, some, you know, in terms of what this final solution was that was desired, we want the dependent variable as a function of the independent variable. Again, I didn't take off this time for that, but I will next time. Or, you know, if you didn't write here to compare that last bit and didn't then do it because it wasn't written in the question, I get that. I took off a point. Okay. Um, number, are there any questions about number nine at this time? Uh, number 11, object is thrown upward in a linear medium. Oh, I don't want that. Okay. I'm going to, for this problem, let the y hat direction be up and write v as a function of time and y as a function of time. I'm going to find the time to reach y max. And I'm going to show that when b and considering the limit where b goes to 0, y max becomes the value that it had in vacuum. And I'm going to do that by doing a Taylor expansion of my natural log. OK, sounds good. So here's my figure. I labeled my coordinate system. My v not y is up. I'm thinking about the time that it is going up. That's what this problem relates to. So in that case, in my free body diagram, the b v force is pointing down. And the weight force is also pointing down. I remember that I've done a problem like this before, and the terminal velocity for this system, I didn't go ahead and calculate it here, but it's quite easy to do. You just set ay equal to zero in this expression, well, in the expression that you would have if you hadn't made the substitution. And you would get that the terminal velocity is mg over b. All right, so I went ahead and made that substitution for mg bv term. And uh, notice that my force is a function of velocity, so it behooves me to write acceleration as the first derivative of velocity, and that gives me a differential equation, an ordinary differential equation that I can solve analytically. 
All right, but then I need to do my separation of variables, so I'm going to multiply, multiply both sides by dt to get dt over there. But here I have a function of v, so I need to divide both sides by that quantity in the parentheses to finally have my variables separated. And then I'll integrate the left-hand side and the right-hand side from initial to final values of my incremental variable. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> All right. Evaluated my my indefinite integral, got these values, and then I needed to solve for v as a function of time and get it alone on one side of the equal sign. Okay, great. Then what I wanted to find also was y as a function of time, just for my statement of my question. So I need to integrate v of t from 0 to t. I need to integrate both sides from initial to final. So I substitute for v of t dy dt, and I multiply both sides by the dt. I didn't show that step, but okay. And I get the integral of dy from initial to final and the integral of this object from times dt from initial to final time, where t initial is 0 and t final is just t. I evaluated my integral, and that's the expression that I got. All right. Then the thing that I know about y max is that at that point it's no longer moving up, but it's not coming down yet either, so the final velocity is 0. I plug in 0, and I solve for what time that would be. <coughs> and once I have that time, I plug that time into my expression for y as a function of time to get y max. And there's some algebra here. Uh, this was for some reason a tricky one, getting that, noticing that um, e to the minus b over m times m over b, well, you could make that negative m over b times natural log of v term over v naught plus v term turns into just uh, v term over v naught plus v term. Anyway, and there is a, a minus one there. Anyway, okay. Um, let me go ahead and make sure that I'm telling you. That. There might be something off the edge of that page that you need. Hold on just a second. Yeah, that is a minus one. Do you guys see that? All right. Okay, and so then I have algebra. I get my final expression for y max. That is good. It does indeed include a natural log. So I use the inside cover of my textbook to find the Taylor expansion of the natural log of 1 plus x, or 1 plus z, or something like that. And went ahead and wrote in my Taylor expansion, evaluated it. The first two terms cancel each other. The third term is the, uh, the first to exist. And I get this expression, which was what was wanted. So. In terms of grading, basically, I think you guys did a really, really, really good job on this. There was some very tricky algebra in here that was worth a point, just because everything up to there was tricky. That that was just, you know, not an egregious error. Um, there was uh, some, again, incorrect statement of the question, dropping, for instance, part C, and therefore not doing part C. So that's at least two points off. Um, okay, I think it was just two points off. Okay, are there any questions before I move on about number 11? Maybe you wanna know how I felt about your performance in number 11, which was, wow, you guys are really good at this. So I'm pleased with that. Very, very well done. Every single one of you did great on that problem. All right. Um, so that's really nice to see. And then also number 27 was a similar situation where it was really, really well done. So, um, but nonetheless, I can go through the solution. I kick a puck of mass M up an inclined theta with initial velocity V naught. There's no friction, but there's drag so that the force on the thing is, there's a drag force on the thing that's equal to CV squared. Write down to solve Newton's second for V as a function of time on the upward journey. How long does the upward journey last? All right, so I have uh, created a figure in which I've labeled my coordinate system. This is just a one-dimensional motion, so I only had to label one. I drew a free body diagram, and then I wrote out Newton's second law for one dimension, which I then plugged into the left-hand side, the sum of all x components of forces, and got that. And on my right-hand side, I noticed that my forces on the left were a function of velocity, so that I should write my acceleration in terms of velocity as well. So I wrote it as the first derivative of velocity. Now, I did this work on scratch paper. I should have shown it. But I also noticed that if this thing 
were going downhill, there would get to a point where it reached its final velocity or its terminal velocity, in which case it wouldn't accelerate anymore. That would be equal to zero. And so I see that in that case, the terminal velocity v squared would be equal to mg sine theta over c. That would be in the case that it was moving down, which is why we have a sign different there. And so the square root of mg sine theta over c, um, wherever I see it, I can call it v terminal squared. Anyway, so I went ahead and made that substitution. And then I notice I have to separate my variables. So I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. I'm going to have to divide both sides by this thing in the brackets in order to get everything that depends on v on the right-hand side, everything that depends on t on the left-hand side. Uh, and then I need to perform my integral. Uh, the integral that I want to use is of the form that's in the front cover, I believe. Front cover of my book? Yeah. Uh, the, the top right one under some integrals in the front cover. So I need to change to a variable, change of variables to uh, the point that it has dx divided by 1 minus x squared. So I do that by dividing my denominators by 1 over vt squared so that I can get my 1 there. In order to do that, I have to divide my numerator by 1 over vt squared just to keep my equal sign good. Then I needed to notice that my derivative, uh, in this case, my, um, my variable is uh, v squared, uh, I'm sorry, v over z is going to be, z squared is v squared over vt squared. All right. So in order to get the derivative, like a dz, I needed to think about the derivative of this object, which is 2 dv over vt, that object being, hopefully that makes sense to you. In order to get that Jacobian and keep my equal sign, I had to multiply by vt. All right. You can tell I'm not a math teacher, but hopefully you can follow along with that. And you really can because basically everybody got this one right too, which was great. All right. And so then I'm ready to evaluate my integrals. I got minus CT on the left-hand side. M over VT because I had 1 over VT squared times VT left over after my integral. So that's 1 over VT times the arc tangent of my Z, which is going to be uh, V over VT, which I have to evaluate where V goes from V naught to V. All right. And I do that. And I get my expression, which then I need to solve for v as a function of time. And I do that here. OK. And also then I'm asked for when the upward journey ends, which is when the <coughs> final velocity is 0. And um, plugging in on my left-hand side that v as a function of t is 0, I solve for the time in which that occurs. I get this expression. So, All right. Um, things that, again, took off points. Um, missing statement of the question is a couple points off. Um, not boxing here. I don't think I took off this time, but we really need to box when we answer one of the questions in the statement of the question. Write down and solve it in second law and that we're journey. So I did the solution. I need to box it. All right. So whenever I've done something that was in the statement of the question, I need to box it. In the future, that will be a point off when it's not boxed. Okay. And then there were, at this point, there were a, a couple of algebra errors because they were here that were just, so they, they, I lost, I took off one or two depending on what the algebra error was. Okay. But again, every single one of you should feel great about this problem. So, because um, you really, 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 really showed me something here and I'm excited for Wednesday. So <coughs> let's talk about the test on Wednesday. My goals in writing the test are going to be to have at least two dynamics problems. And if I can find cute enough dynamics problems, I might have one last problem that's purely a math problem, but I kind of doubt that that's going to be possible, but we'll see. So I want some, one of my problems to be where you're going to uh, use you know, Newton's second law to find an equation of motion. And I want it to be related to first chapter. So where the force can either be a function of location or of time, like it was in David and Goliath. Do you know what I'm talking about? So you could have that force as a function of x or it's a function of t. And you can find, as a result, the motion. All right? So that would just be like a one-dimensional type of thing. I want to find something cute like that. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? All right. And then for a second problem, I really want to do something like uh, number 11 or 27 from this problem set, mostly because you guys showed me that this is the thing I should, you guys want to show me what you can do, 
we'll do some more like that because you guys can do that very well. And I'm, again, totally blown away at how good these homeworks are. So I'm very pleased with that. And I'm going to give you a chance to show me that you are facile with that on the test. So what I mean by that is that we'll do another dynamics problem where you have to use Newton's second law as an equation of motion to solve for motion. But now the force will be some function of velocity. All right, so that type of thing. All right, so those are things I definitely want to put on that test because that's really the, the heart of the matter. Um, so I'll just call it right now. I mean, I, you will be using some math and stuff, but I don't think I'll have a pure math question. Right. Okay. Are there any questions about that? It will take place in class, and it will be designed to take 50 minutes. All right. Five problems? No, two. We're talking two multi-part problems. Okay. Two multi-part problems. I don't know exactly how many. If you want to yeah, work that out. Um, but fresh problems. Fresh problems that are similar to what you can do. They won't be like, I give you this exact problem. Yeah. Um, so we, we won't really need a crib sheet, will we? No, there's really nothing to put on the crib sheet. So, um, and if you feel like you need to use the inside cover of a textbook, I can leave this up here and you can come look at it as needed. Um, but my goal is that, you know, anything like that would be given to you in the statement of the question, anything that's needed. But if you find that there's something that I forgot, which I am human, and that can happen, come tell me, and I'll either write it on the board for everybody or let you use the cover of my book for whatever. Okay? All right. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So we left off last time. Last time before we did the computer stuff. And we had done... Oh, by the way, I just want to point out that the rocket problem is chapter three. This test is not going to include material from chapter three. It's chapters one and two. Um, so that won't be a possibility. No need to study that. Um, so, but last time that I lectured, we had left off and we were trying to find the uh, center of mass of something. And then I, we had this expression for a system of particles. And then we had different expressions for a continuum of mass in terms of finding the location of the center of mass. And we were doing this problem where we were finding the center of mass of this cone. And we had discussed that the x and y component must be zero by symmetry of the object. Its geometrical uh, line of symmetry is along the z-axis, so the center of mass must lie along that line. And uh, because it's uniform density, that is the case. And uh, so we went ahead and noted that the x and y components are zero. And in order to find the z component, I needed to find the integral of z dm divided by the ma total mass. And we did that. Okay. So we have a final expression here that's in terms of total mass. But it would be great, and it would yield a much simpler result if I could make a substitution with the total mass of the cone. So we're going to pick up there, because we didn't have time, and let's all just start from there to find our expression for the mass of the cone. And I'll remind you that we have a figure of the cone. We're just finding the mass of the cone in terms of the variables given in the figure. So I have a height of h, a top radius of r. Um, do you guys want to reform into your groups to work on this? All right, well, how about um, Let's go ahead and do that. You can either be in pairs if you want. I see sort of natural pairings, and you can be in a group of three. Or you can make two big groups, which is fine as well, whatever you'd like to do. Go ahead. We'll, take, we'll, we'll go ahead and take at least 10 minutes to get this done. Again, we're knocking the rust off of your Calc 3 here. So. Would you 
say the bounds were again? I'm sorry. You oh, you want to see the previous work here? Uh, okay, are you sure? That's a good question, though. an error here. I, I evaluated this, but I left my Z. It should be an H there. Hopefully you see why that should be an H. Just evaluating from above. That's what happens at the end of class when I start going fast. All right? That makes more sense.
that's right. density. <coughs> yeah. I used, if you want to see that work there. Yeah. Yeah. Wish I could get that to balance there, but it just slides. Once you get your expression for mass, go ahead and plug it in where you see this M here and get a, you know, simplify to get your expression for a Z. It's a function.
your expression for M, is it? Yes, okay, so this is what you, you plugged it, that back in here and you got that. Let's go ahead and pick up from there because it sounds like people are getting there and it's wonderful. All right. So that's where I'll pick up. All right. So I've got, in this case, I'm going to just redraw my figure. Got sort of a cone like that. It's got a top radius, capital R. It's got a height of h. And I want to find its mass, which is the integral of rho dv, where its increment of volume has, um, is, has a volume of, uh, let's go with dr times r d phi times dz. So I've got an integral here, and I've got three increments, so I'm going to have to have to sum over all of them. And I've got rho, which is a constant, times, um, I'll go with dz, r dr, d phi. Just write them in that order. I'm going to do phi first, 0 to pi, because I have to go all the way around with that value phi to get all the increments of mass included. So I've got rho times 2 pi. So as I just get 5 from 0 to 2 pi, which is 2 pi minus 0, or 2 pi. And then I've got to do an integral dz. And I'm going to do dz last because, again, anybody else would have done this, and you might have done it the wrong way around, which is fine. That means you got to the end of the road. You need to back up from the dead end and do it the other way. So I need to integrate r dr, where r goes from 0 out to the edge of the cone. So it goes from 0 out to r over h times z. All right, so I got rho times 2 pi times r squared over 2 from 0 to rz over h. And then I've got a dz. And I notice, oh, this is going to have a z dependence. I have to put my integral sign back there and integrate that from 0 to h. OK, so I've got 2 pi rho. Um, r squared, let's go ahead and write this as zero h part. R squared over, let's go ahead and put our one half up front, over h squared times z squared dz, which gives me, uh, my twos cancel here. So I get pi rho r squared over h squared. And then I get <coughs> z cubed over 3 that I have to evaluate from 0 to h. And I get pi rho r squared h cubed over 3 h squared. I got a fresh piece of paper here. Did somebody do the cell phone on that desk where you're working right now? I haven't seen a cell phone. Oh, you mean right here? Yeah. Here, you will. I don't know. I mean, I, come over and have a look. No, you would see it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, sure. Just one second. There's a secret compartment somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> okay. Guess this one is not. All right. Anyway. Um. All right. So. Final expression for M, 
pi rho r squared h over 3. Let me see if that's actually what I got. OK. All right, and now for the z component of the center of mass, I've got pi, I'm sorry, rho pi r squared h to the fourth divided by 4h squared. OK, that's kind of a weird way to write it, but OK. Times 1 over mass, so that would be 3 over pi rho r squared h. That h crossed is still an h, sorry. So I've got my rows are canceling, my pi's are canceling, my r squareds are canceling. I've got 3 fourths, h to the fourth over h cubed, h. All right, so the center of mass of this object is at 0, 0, 3 fourths. And we're done. So we box it. All right? So, um, yes, that is that if you haven't done it in a while, there's going to be like a couple of little ticky tack sort of holes you're going to step in. And don't worry about that. Just keep moving forward and plan to uh, avoid those in the future. So that's it. That was great. Now, the next thing I have to do is talk about part four of chapter three which is something completely different, angular momentum. Does it make sense to start something completely different right before a test on Wednesday? So I'm not going to. I'll see you on Wednesday, and have a good day. In my original calculation before she went through it, I got eight over four, so I just missed the <laughs>